still loving your photos. Welcome to my show, Posing Conversations. The focus of the show is to talk about how we live out our divine purpose by living out each day and making an intention for our life. And today I have a guest. His name is Bill Bull, and he's just from the St. Croix Valley, and welcome, Bill. Thank you, Anita. Glad to be here. Good. Bill, tell me a little bit about yourself and what your life is like. Okay. Well, I'm a riverboat captain uh, on the Andiamo Riverboat in Stillwater, uh, Minnesota here, locally. And uh, I've been doing that for a number of years. Also part of the family that uh, owned uh, Paddleford Riverboats in uh, the St. Paul, Minneapolis area. And uh, uh, so I've pretty much been a, a boat captain my entire uh, adult life. And uh, I uh, really enjoy it. And uh, I'm presently living over in uh, New Richmond. Uh, uh, New Richmond has the same population that uh, Stillwater had when we moved here way back in 1962, where it was just under uh, 8,000 people. And I like the small town atmosphere, so I'm over there. And, uh, just one other thing I'll mention I'm also uh, that I love to do. I'm uh, also a uh, uh, musician and uh, uh, seems to go hand in hand with being a riverboat captain. You either play a guitar or sing or. Uh, <laughs> something in that order and uh, I love to do that uh, percussion uh, keyboards and uh, guitar so so you do that around the different clubs and different venues yeah I uh, started uh, with another captain uh, started an open mic format around the area here and uh, I uh, got involved uh, uh, with that open mic uh, series that they were doing and uh, fell in love with it and uh, met uh, a lot of new uh, people that uh, uh, I really enjoyed and have become really good friends with. And uh, as a result of the open mic format, uh, a lot of mixing and matching took place and a lot of uh, bands were formed. and. Uh, for instance, I just played with a band called Harrison Street uh, uh, Saturday ago here at uh, Manitou Station in White Bear Lake, and that's uh, the uh, Harrison Street uh, uh, band was all uh, developed out of uh, the uh, open mic series that oh, uh, uh, the other captain had put together. Yeah. And a lot of fun with it. So. so kindred spirits with the kind of music and yeah. how you do it and when you do it. And right. Nice. Yeah. <coughs> That's a great connection in a bunch of uh, wonderful people. Well, that's good. Great. Yeah. Well, um, is there a topic you wanted to talk about today? Well, I uh, thought about the uh, divine, uh, uh, um, how did you word it? Divine. Your divine purpose. D divine purpose. And um, I do have a divine purpose. I uh, uh, initially, when you talked about it, I thought about uh, I've taken the uh, Rick Warren's uh, Purpose Driven Life uh, series a couple of times, and um, so I understand that uh, the purpose, because that's the main uh, focal point of that book, is uh, what are you made for? What is your purpose? And uh, I have an understanding of that, but the story goes way back uh, uh, to my college uh, days when I was an agnostic, and uh, the journey uh, through my adult life has taken me uh, uh, to where I am now as a definitely not an agnostic mm -hmm. and uh, have developed quite a, a spiritual uh, existence and program along the way. So I thought that would be a good... Uh, focus to talk about okay. today. Well, tell me a little bit about what it was like when you were agnostic or before that. Well, I... Uh, what were you like? Right. I... You know how you are when you're in college. You're very... Uh, I was very philosophical and uh, and plus you know it all. And, and you know, and I was no exception. I... Uh, I ended up being an English and philosophy major, so that was kind of uh, uh, 
uh, my forte anyway uh, on that line. I remember uh, books like Why I'm Not a Christian by uh, Bertram Russell, that sort of thing. Those were my early influences. And uh, uh, so I, I didn't have a positive experience uh, growing up with my uh, Lutheran roots. I, I just uh, wasn't connecting. Uh, with the religion, and uh, um, I went through a period where, uh, um, uh, if I believed in God, I was probably angry with him, mm -hmm. and uh, thus it was. Uh, uh, I'm an agnostic, almost like so there, and uh, uh, I remained that way for uh, some time, a few years, uh, and then I. Uh, I think I was still in college when I started reading uh, uh, a lot of Edgar Casey books. Mm -hmm. You're familiar with Edgar mm -hmm. Casey, yeah. yeah. And uh, everything that I read uh, uh, about him, all of his books, made perfect sense to me. And uh, that was the uh, the start of uh, uh, my road uh, uh, to. Uh, what I believe in today, my, my uh, form of spirituality, was really uh, deep in uh, 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 Edgar Cayce uh, roots. I, uh, I read a lot of He wrote a lot of books, mm -hmm. and uh, I'll, I'll be willing to bet I read over uh, 40 of them. Wow. So, you know, there's some people that maybe haven't read Edgar Cayce's. So why don't you tell them about the philosophy okay. and what your insight is about what you learned from reading all that. Right. Well, uh, Edgar Casey was a, a devout uh, Christian, and um, I don't remember his age when he started having these visions, but uh, um, when he was a kid, he uh, fell asleep on his Bible, and, went, and uh, uh, when he woke up or he had a dream, like he had this vision that uh, um, later in life... Uh, um, some powerful things were going to happen. And uh, I don't remember exactly where he was in his adult life when uh, almost by accident that he uh, started uh, realizing that he had a gift of healing. Mm -hmm. uh, and it would be when he would go into a, a trance-like state. And uh, uh, I think he probably started out helping his friends, and uh, uh, it grew from there once the uh, uh, word got around. He was uh, an incredible healer, mm -hmm. and um, it was some very bizarre things that he would uh, see in the trance, and mm -hmm. uh, like, well, remove your molar. I mean, it's like, uh -huh. what? And they would remove their molar, and it would take care of whatever the uh, uh, illness was or whatever was uh, bothering them, and uh, these were all things that came to him in the trance. But the bigger... Um, picture uh, of Edgar Cayce was where he went when he was in the, uh, these trances and uh, the spiritual bene uh, spiritual be beings that he uh, connected with mm -hmm. and uh, it wasn't uh, too long before some of the reasons for the ailments were based on karma and uh, past life experiences, which Edgar Cayce did not believe in. And uh, I believe he shut it down for a while because he didn't like where it was going. And uh, once he trusted it and uh, the spirit guides that were uh, connecting with him, he uh, basically had a leap of faith himself, and uh, uh, there was no turning back after that point. Mm -hmm. And uh, through that and through Edgar Cayce's trances uh, came this wonderful uh, uh, philosophy of life with uh, reincarnation and, and uh, uh, a very good view of the uh, spirit realm and uh, uh, how we're connected and uh, the meaning of uh, birth and uh, rebirth and, and uh, what we're trying to do here in the physical realm and, and uh how we're trying to improve uh, our our spirituality, basically, mm -hmm. and uh, um, it uh, became extremely fascinating to me mm -hmm. at that point. 
Um, I was, uh, it brought me out of my uh, ag agnostic thinking, and now I was, uh, I would have labeled myself a Christian, but some Christians wouldn't call you a Christian no. because they don't believe in reincarnation. Mm -hmm. So therefore, well, then I have my own religion, which I found out later, well, or you can just call it your spirituality. And that's what I went with. And I was like, all right, well, I, I got to go with what my, my heart tells me and uh, uh, what I believe in uh, based on what I read. And I continued to read. And uh, I'm out of college uh, at this point, but I'm uh, continuing to read uh, uh, a number of books on all the uh, various uh, religions and the histories of the religions. And... Uh, um, I was fascinated with uh, uh, Buddhism, uh, Zen Buddhism. I, I read the uh, Tibetan Book of the Dead. I, that was a book that impacted me. Um, I, uh, I liked a lot of things about the Eastern religions, but uh, ultimately I was more comfortable with my uh, own background, with the Western, mm -hmm. uh, uh, more personal type of uh, uh, higher power of God. And uh, that's what I ultimately, ultimately came back to. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I believed in a more of a personal uh, uh, higher power. And um, um, I did believe in reincarnation. I did believe in karma. Um, I did believe uh, that we are connected uh, to the uh, spirit realm and uh, that we are uh, spiritual beings having a human experience mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. growing uh, uh, and evolving uh, as we go. And uh, I continued to read. I, I uh, read the uh, Rick Warren's uh, Purpose Driven Life series. I, uh, uh, at this point, I was uh, uh, real active in church as well, even though I didn't have the true Christian beliefs. I was uh, really involved with a church at the time when... Uh, I took this uh, uh, Purpose Driven Life series, um, and I really liked the book. And uh, I wasn't threatened by all the, uh, um, if you want to call it, staunch Christian beliefs within mm -hmm. the book. Mm -hmm. It didn't scare me away. I really like Rick Warren, and... Uh, um, I really think he uh, did a good job of defining uh, what our purpose is, our divine purpose. And uh, so when you said, you know, what is your divine purpose, yeah. I, I have a very clear picture today of what my divine purpose is, even though it's not complex. Uh, it's actually uh, very simple. I, I understand there's a difference uh, on one uh, level of uh, self-centeredness and on the other level God-centeredness. Mm -hmm. And the, the more I can move to the uh, God-centered state, the more I'm going to be available to Him. Mm -hmm. And that is my divine purpose, is uh, to be open and available uh, if He uh, comes calling. And I didn't throw this out of uh, the blue. It's happened to me. Yeah. It's happened to me on a number of occasions. So uh, that's another thing I base my spirituality on today is on actual uh, events mm -hmm. that really did happen to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it's pretty powerful stuff, as I'm sure you will know. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and uh, um, so that's what I... Uh, through the years, uh, have based my spirituality on is uh, some books. Another one is um, um, uh, one you're I know familiar with is uh, uh, help me out the uh, miracle uh, the course, uh, of miracles. course of miracles, and uh, uh, also one of the most powerful books I've ever read. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there's. Uh, uh, been a few others, but it, it a few books 
And uh, after reading a lot of books, I mean, a few books stand out, but then also just by actual uh, experience of uh, uh, what I really do see and how I perceive uh, uh, the spirituality aspect of life, uh, uh, what it really is, is based on what I've experienced, and that's what I base it on. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, I wanted to get back to um, a little bit about what Edgar Casey's work was because, um, as you know, I'm a certified master hypnotherapist, and I have kind of been trying to take the um, woo-woo out of what hypnosis is because people think it's, okay, they're going to make me quack like a duck or hold my hand up in the air or have me repeat something, and, and some of the myths about that is that I won't ever come out of trance. You know, or something will be suggested and then I'll do it always and I'll make a fool of myself. Just, you know, myths. And our body, scientifically, will go into trance every 20 to 90 minutes automatically. And I'm sure you've gone right past an exit sometime when you're driving down the street. And you're like, how did I miss that? Where was I? I know that I had intentions of driving up into that or down into that exit, but I drove right by it. Or if you're watching television, you all of a sudden notice that you're holding the remote control up here, and you're like, oh, why am I doing that? So that's, it's a natural algorithm, and we do it right before we go to sleep. And so what he could possibly do is set an intention of what he wanted to see in that algorithm and then go there or be receiving. And I think that the, the process of going into trance we can be talked into it or we can talk ourselves into it. And there are all kinds of ways that people go into hypnosis nowadays with um, different tapes, with the different um, actions. When you go walking your dog alongside of the river, you're, wa you're walking yourself into a trance because you're all of a sudden cool and calm in that area, in that you know, metaphor of what that all is in nature. And the other part of that is that you know the athletes, they get themselves geared up in order to see themselves succeeding in the future. They see themselves out there doing it before they do it. They might be, be sitting in a room with a videotape and they're watching something. They might have headphones and be listening to something. Or they might be actually actively running and doing something. But they can, you can be in trance and be having your heart elevated. Where in meditation, your heart is lowered by 25%. But in trance, you can actually be doing something very active and burn calories while you're doing it because your energy level is up. Oh. So it depends on what is suggested during that time of trance. So apparently, Edgar Casey was going in to find out new ideas and new information and then opening up the vortexes for those spirit guides to come in, for angels to come in, for information to come in about what is supposed to be or how to help heal people. You know, and meditation for me is that that's when that happens to me. Is when I am in meditation, I'm intentionally asking now, what is it, God, that you want me to bring out today? And I'll get little intuitive snippets, but if I don't act on those, then for me, that's not living that divine purpose and kind of packing that down. And most of us do it out of fear, where we won't follow through with that little voice. And come on, DJ. Mm -hmm. You need to say something to that person. You need to step out and get in front of people and do this with people. That little voice is usually that divine purpose speaking. Yeah. And that self-centeredness that you were talking about. I was watching a show this morning about addiction, and it's like anything that sends us into our neurology that we're compelled to do it. It doesn't have to be a chemical that is induced in our body. It's anything that will send that synapsis into saying, I want more. I want to do that again. It feels good. I want to do it more. It's not something that is outside of us that comes into us. It's already in there. Uh -huh. So, And it's not a chemical imbalance. It's that we have to learn how to program our brains and how to make sure that we keep it in balance. And for me, it's by living that divine life where I'm tapping into what is my purpose here and why am I doing this. And should I keep doing it the way I'm doing it? To always have some kind of thoughtful way of it. And I have in, um, a couple of different techniques in my practice where I actually bring people into a healing timeline if they've been traumatized. And I'll set them out in their timeline, and they'll be in trance. And I'll say, so is this trauma further in your past, in your ancestry, in your genealogy, or is it in a past life? And people will know immediately. They'll say it's past life, or they'll say 
in a generation. And then I'll ask which generation, how many generations ago or how many past lives ago. And I'm sometimes profoundly surprised that it's in both sides. Mm -hmm. So then it's not something that is necessarily that they've just experienced, they're repeating a pattern that was set up years and years and years ago. And I've had that myself where three, four generations ago there was a setup where females in the family were given over uh, to a husband. And so and my grandfather married a woman that was 15 and he was 30. And I wondered about that too, how would that happen? You know, she was, she, to me was a child mm -hmm. and she was handed over. So there was this system of how people got married in the family system, but it was three generations ago and I know that because I went back and looked. Mm -hmm. And people can do that. A lot of us need help with the language and guided meditation and how to go there and how to know that. But our unconscious mind knows that information. And so when he was talking about, Edward Casey was talking about those incidences, he had a knack for going into his unconscious and gathering that information from those past lives and incarnations, knowing what the karmic was, the karma was through those p places and being able to heal it as he went along with himself and with others. It's amazing. It is. Know? It yeah. is. And it's, you know, a lot of us think that we have to decide whether it's our soul or whether it's science. And our neurology is electricity. We have neurology in our heart and we have neurology in our head. And the heart neurology was there before the brain was even formed. And for me, that's like, okay, that's where we feel, that's where we know. That's where we direct our thinking when we, we're intuitive or we think we're getting something empathically. We direct that to our mm -hmm. hearts to feel it out, to see how it is. Yeah. So to me, it's like, is that where soul is? Because if it's not there, then it's all around us. Because that electricity then emanates. It cannot just be contained inside the skin. Our skin is just, I mean, we're 90% water. Right. So if you add electricity and water, what do you have? You think about that when people say, you know, if there's a power line on the ground and it's in a puddle, stay away from it. Well, we're a power line. <laughs> we're a power line and we're a puddle walking around. So we've got this energy and we have the ability to control it with how we think or what we do and what our emotional state is. And I think those of us that have gone into um, different processes, you know, like the purpose-driven life, you mm -hmm. have different practices that you do. And most of them a way to rethink our old negative thoughts into positive ways of thinking. And to have something not just looking at the past and regretting it, but looking at the past and making it useful to heal other people. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, you know some of my, my wounds. There's so much trauma. There's, it's just no good reason for me to have gone through all the things I did. I'm a good person. But all of those three things have made it so I can be very fine-tuned into other people. And it's like the old radios that used to have the transistor in them. You had to kind of tune it in. Well, that's how I think my spirituality is that I just have to keep tuning in and then I get those little transmissions from God and I know what I'm supposed to do with that person or situation. And I'm not surprised as much as I used to be. You know, when I, I've been looking at how everything and everybody is interconnected, so when I start out my day, I'm like, oh, I'm going to be surprised by how magical that is. And we always think it's a coincidence that we run some into somebody here or there or we hear something and, oh, what a coincidence, I heard it three times already today. And I think it's a coincidence of information that needs to happen in order to break open a new thought process or to have some more um, ability to go, okay, I see how it's all interconnected. But if I start my day with the intention that I will recognize how everything and everybody is all interconnected, blows my mind, blows my mind. I have a situation where a friend of mine has got some negative energy in his house. He had a retreat in his house. Uh, you know, a bunch of women went and stayed there. And there's some things that happened that seemed like there was a ghost in the house. So he called me and said, hey, you know, what do you think I should do? And I said, well, I can come out and do some clearing. And, you know, and I went out there and I knew what was going on. And I came home and I had this whole, I want to say, download of information of different herbs and different processes and different things and could actually see what really kind of needed to be done. And then he said, oh, yeah, I know this guy who does the same kind of work. Do you think you can collaborate with him? And I was like, sure, whatever, whenever. And by chance, they all, both of them and I ended up in my office this morning, and it was not a fun event. 
It was not a planned event. There was no appointment scheduled. I thought they were coming at 1 o'clock while I was going to be here. Mm. You know, it was not a planned event. And then we started talking about the situation, and I just realized it's, we're all interconnected. We're all supposed to do the treatment on this place. We're all supposed to go in and do whatever we do in our different practices, and that we'll learn from each other, and that'll make us better practitioners because we all learn what the other person does. How cool is that? Oh, yeah. You know, wow. to have like a triad right. with different, you know, beliefs, yeah. you know, and wow. yeah. yeah. I mean, one, one fellow is an astrologer, and he does house clearings with all kinds of stuff, and the other one is a shaman, and then there's me. So it's a really interesting dynamic, but I'm open to that. Yeah. And if, if I close my mind off to any new ideas, then I don't get any new ideas. Then right. I stay doing the same thing. And I'm curious about everything in life now. If I hear about one little thing, I'm like, oh, I'm going to go online and learn all I can about that. What does that mean? Because mm -hmm. I'm curious. And that's part of my process in divine living is I want to know more so I can hear more, mm -hmm. so I can touch more. And the more information I can get for myself, you know, why not, why not use this time? Right. You know, I'm 52 years old. If I got 40 years, why don't I got, I want to fill up, not just do and do and do and do. That's part of me being, spirit, uh, being a spirit being instead of just being a human yeah. being. If I can get my spirit to liven up and really be the front runner instead of the body be the front run runner. Right. You know what I mean? Right, yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was, I, on that same line, I always feel like I, I need to be responsible. If I have an awareness, then I need to be responsible to be in my God-centered self so I'm available. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think a lot of times there's nobody available. And the Lord, you know, uh, there isn't anybody, and uh, uh, that's kind of a sad, you know, revelation. But I, I think it's no, probably nobody true. available for to help in any uh, certain given situation. I think the Lord is always looking for uh, uh, people to help in this situation and that situation, and that's how that soft thought comes in our head, you know, to help this person. Well, maybe we're the only one around, but if we're having a self-centered day, we're uh, we're missing the the boat here, and uh, that poor person doesn't get any help that day. Yeah. And uh, so maybe his his prayer was, "Lord, please help me." And the Lord's trying, yeah. but it didn't work out that day, yeah. you know. And uh, no, I think we have to wrap it up. I'm sorry to okay. interrupt you. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> I just got the one minute warning. But it's really, you know, it's a good thought to end on, is that if we're too busy to do what God wants us to do, and we're doing what we want to do, or what we think we have to do, or what we should do for our family, for our friends, for work, for school, it's all in our heads. You know, what does our heart really want to do? Right. And what does God really want us to do? And why would I say no to God over my employer? Right. It's, it, it's just kind of a sad state because I see that, too, where I'll make a phone call and someone will say, I'll get back to you, and they don't. You know, and I will call somebody needing help, needing to give you know, some support, get some support, get some encouragement, and they'll say, I'll call you later, and they don't. And I just don't want to be that person. Yeah. I want to be the one who answers the phone. So anyway, um, I want to thank you all for coming and tuning into the show today. Um, I'm Anita White. I'm a life coach with White Rider Coaching Quest, and my show is Coaching Conversations. And I want to leave you with one last thought. No matter what you think you are, you are always so much more than that.